Hello, my name is Bianca Michelle and I am a Community Development Officer at the Gladstone Regional Council. Today, I would like to welcome you to our annual Avenue to Awareness event. Avenue to Awareness aims to shine a spotlight on mental health and wellbeing. Mental illness comes in many different forms and no two experiences are the same. Through Avenue to Awareness, we are providing a platform for courageous young people to share their stories in the hope that they can speak up and speak out about their mental health journey. All the young people here today have unique stories to share and all have desires to share the message that it's important to take time for your mental health. I would like to introduce our first key speaker today. Thanks very much for the opportunity to say a few words. Avenue to awareness. I hope that you will be inspired. In actual fact, I will, I'm sure that you will be inspired by the stories that will be told by members of our Gladstone Regional Youth Council and the young people of our region. The other part also is that I'm extremely proud and our Gladstone Regional Council is extremely proud of the bravery of these young people to be able to personalise their stories so that there is a message for everybody. My message today is if you are going through hell, then in fact, keep going because the stories today will help you to come to the outside of that a much better person. There are many stories that can be told. There are many personal stories, some you have heard in this series, of people within our region who face the daily challenges of having a purpose in life. Take the time to place your hand over your heart. Can you feel it? That is called purpose. You're alive for a reason. Don't ever, ever give up. Sometimes people want to die simply because they believe they have no reason to continue living. I speak with personal experience. We have a responsibility for the safety, the health, and the well-being of the people within our region. The person who completes suicide dies only once. Those that are left behind, friends and family, die a thousand times wondering, trying to understand why. Everyone deserves to be able to reach their full potential. Can I say to you, never judge yourself through the eyes of other people and do not let others live rent free in your mind. We should look for the signs. We need to take the time to have the vital discussions. Listen and take the action. The fact is at the end of the day, we all need to show that compassion. We know that we have the kindness within us to give to others and we have the professional support services. Our young people today will inspire you. Take the message away. Make a difference for yourself and make a difference to the well-being and the future of those wonderful people around you. Thank you. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first key speaker today. His name is Max Thompson and he is our chair of the Gladstone Regional Youth Council. Max will be talking about stereotypes, meditation, mindfulness, manners, breakdowns and stereotyping stigmas. Please welcome Max to the stage. Good day everyone and welcome to Avenue to Awareness 2020. The Gladstone Regional Council and Gladstone Regional Youth Council have amalgamated once again this year to discuss mental well-being. Before officially commencing, I would like to make an acknowledgement to country. So without further ado, I invite us to acknowledge the custodians of the land from which we gather, the Garang, Garang Garang, Bayeli and Terrabalung Bunda peoples. We pay respect to elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the memories, traditions, hopes and cultures of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across the state. A better understanding and respect for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples develops an enriched appreciation of Australia's cultural heritage and can lead to reconciliation. This is essential to the maturity of Australia as a nation and fundamental to the development of an Australian identity. Due to the nature of the topics that will be in discussion this evening, I advise all viewers feeling distressed to not hesitate to reach out and talk to a friend or family member. If you feel either isolated or anxious in doing so, you can contact Lifeline, Kids Helpline, Beyond Blue or eHeadspace. To launch into this evening's event, I'm going to discuss stereotyping and the implications it has on young people and how stereotypes have affected me personally. 
In today's multifaceted age, where a great proportion of us enjoy socially interacting through a flat interactive touchscreen, it comes to me as no surprise that the dynamics of society have altered. On that note, it's also not surprising to see how stereotyping has changed over the years as well. Throughout history, stereotyping has played a significant role in the way us humans act and think. Simply put, stereotyping is in our very human nature. It is understandable if we categorise a person as a nerd if they're introverted with a technical or scientific mindset or rich if they happen to always be catched up or even dodgy if we're always seeing them interact with random people coming in and out of a dark alleyway late at night. Ultimately, stereotyping can be useful in some situations. Determining whether people are hypothetically bad or good is extremely important in everyday socialising, but permanently assigning a particular judgement to a particular attribute based on its presence across a negative spectrum of associations is not fair. It's important to understand that every time we permanently associate a particular attribute as either bad or good, we're closing our minds and becoming biased. Personally, the concept of stereotyping is something I have struggled with in the past. And although I'm improving, I've still got a long road ahead of me. When it comes to social interaction, often my wording in a conversation can be either harsh or overkill. I never used to consider myself a bully or a negative person. However, in hindsight, maybe I was. From memory, my past was riddled with the joy of stereotypes. I used to make fun out of people or just pass unnecessary comments or judgments about people based off their physical, gender, racial, or even religious traits. Due to this misguided mindset I had created for myself, I was never a person to get offended when someone tried to have a go at me. In fact, rather than having a sook, I would often just laugh or shrug it off. But little did I know, this was all going to change one day. For my last three years in primary school, I ran a garden club, socially constricted and playing to my own accord. In this club, I spent most of my lunch breaks learning the responsibilities of middle management. Above me were my teachers, and below me was any peer who entered the garden area. As a result of the intricate way I lived in my early years, where my brain was rapidly defined by all the interactions I had, I became a pretty stubborn and a pretty bad tempted character to be around. This led to complications such as my inability in differentiating between sarcasm and an intentional statement. After my primary journey came my unforgiving transition into high school, where I was a short, overweight young male with a shirt always tucked in, the highest socks in class, and a very short crew cut. Golly gee. This is where stereotypes really started to affect me. Many people that didn't know me too well thought I was the smartest, most well-behaved student in the grade. My classmates, on the other hand, well, they thought the exact opposite. This is where I realised the conundrum with stereotypes. Just because someone always has their socks pulled up with a shirt tucked in and a short haircut does not mean they're well behaved or a genius. I know that I'm most certainly none of those. So after a couple more years of exercising my rights to be a bigoted, narrow-minded loudmouth, I made a commitment to proving to myself and others that I am better than stereotypes. I started practicing the three M's, meditation, mindfulness, and manners. Fortunately for me, I did not have to do this alone. I've had friends and family alike support me on my expedition to an open-minded mindset. In recognition of my hard work, grade 10 became my first ever year to achieve a golden academic award. In grade 11, I rose to the ranks of a martial arts senpai and was successful in my application to the National Youth Science Forum in Canberra. And this year in grade 12, I was appointed to the Gladstone Region Youth Council and eventually appointed as our chair by Mayor Burnett. In all honesty, I'm amazed by the power that living a life not dictated by stereotypes has. I'm also amazed by how far a little manners can really take you, or how mindfulness and meditation can really change the effectiveness of your social interactions. Now, just to be clear, I'm not saying that the traits I've obtained through a little meditation, mindfulness and manners are perfect. I'm still and will always be on my journey to being the very best version of myself. So before I am hushed and seated, here are a couple things I would like you to take away and integrate into your own lifestyle if you haven't already. Number one, a few more manners goes a long way. Number two, stop judging and start listening. Okay, that's all from me. Thanks for your time and please enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you, Max, for sharing your story. 
Next, we have up Jared Lowry. Jared's topic today is talking about his personal experience with mental illness, grief and loss. What do you say, what do you do, and how do you overcome it? Hello, my name is Jared Lowry. I'm 17 and I'm a part of the Gladstone Regional Youth Council. Today, I will be talking to you about grief and how it has impacted my mental health. What is grief? Grief is the response to loss, particularly to the loss of someone or something that has been lost to which a bond or affection was formed. Although conventionally focused on the emotional response to loss, it also has physical, cognitive, behavioral, social, cultural, and spiritual dimensions. There are seven stages of grief, shock and denial, pain and guilt, anger, depression, then the upward turn, reconstruction, and working through acceptance and hope. Grief can be the loss of a loved one, a breakup with a partner, or the loss of a family pet. I've had a long fight with my mental illness. I've experienced this for just over five years. The time before all this happened, I was an active and energetic kid. I was playing heaps of sports and was always looking for new things to do. In 2015, at the age of 13, I lost two friends one to cancer and the other to suicide. As a young person, this was the start of my, of my mental illness. I started to lose interest in things, zone out, exclude myself from my family and friends. My bedroom was my best friend. I barely left it. From being a very interactive child to not interacting with anyone, this was a sign that not everything was okay. As a young person, you probably don't take much notice of what is going on but from a parent's perspective, they could clearly see something was wrong. I had hit a new low. This progressively got worse and worse. Then around the middle of grade eight, I finally went to see a doctor and they recommended me for medication. Even though this was not a fix, it did help. In 2016, I lost two dearly loved pets. My little brother was diagnosed with a serious chronic illness. My grandfather suddenly passed away and even though I wasn't close to him, on top of everything else that has been happening, my mental health took another big hit. Through the help and support of my family and friends, I finally decided to stay on my medication properly and get the help I needed. Prior to this, I was on and off my medication, decided to randomly stop taking it. This was not the best decision. It made me hit new lows again. I started doing things I shouldn't do. It was a hard period of my life. Even though suicide and self-harm never really crossed my mind, there were, there were always times I just did not see the point to it all. I was depressed and tired 24 hours, seven days a week. As I matured and got older, I started to understand what the problem really was. Grief happens unexpectedly. We will all go through it at some stage. It is the way you deal with it and how you let it control your life that is the most important thing. Through the help of family, friends and professionals, there are always people who can support you through grief and the tough periods in your life. I appreciate everyone listening to my story and my personal experience with grief and hope everyone knows that you're not alone. There was always support around you. Thank you. Thank you, Jared, for sharing your story and the importance of speaking up to the people around you if you were going through a tough time. Our next speaker, Melly, um, will be talking today about self-love and self-care. Please welcome Melly to the stage. We, as young people, have become completely desensitized to the idea of loving ourselves. Because as much as we are told to do it, we are also told to look a certain way, dress a certain way, do this and that so we can become a certain way. Boys, Men, you have to be six feet tall and made of pure muscle. You need to be able to do X amount of pull-ups and squat X kilograms in the gym, all the while loving yourselves. Girls, women, we need to be lean, but thick with two Cs. We need to be natural, but not too natural, otherwise we're slobs, all the while loving ourselves. And to the people who identify beyond the constraints of cis, you pose a threat to society's binary gender roles. Your fluidity is seen as confusing, alarming even, 
your refusal to be either masculine or feminine goes against everything we have been taught to accept. And you need to go through life knowing this, experiencing this every single day of your lives, all the while loving yourselves. Society has made self-love and body acceptance conditional to obtaining these absurd beauty standards that are currently worshipped. And the problem here is that not only are our own bodies constantly changing and developing, but these beauty standards are too. So we base the love and acceptance that we have for ourselves on something that is constantly fluctuating. <laughs> Do you remember those tiny little eyebrows that used to be a thing, like the little line across your face and people used to pluck and wax them so that they'd be super skinny? Honestly, take a look at what trendy eyebrows look like now. They're full and thick and the complete opposite of what they used to be. You see, when we base the love we have for ourselves on something that is constantly changing, we will always be on a roller coaster, chasing those societal beauty standards and therefore chasing the self-love and acceptance that we have denied ourselves for so long, but never actually getting anywhere. <laughs> this roller coaster becomes even more dangerous the moment media, especially social media, becomes a cart that we can ride in. Honestly, take your pick. Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, TikTok, Stan, Netflix, even the news. The news is riddled with this distorted idea of beauty. As we scroll, we become buried in this mound of diet culture and fitspo and weight loss and what I eat in a daze. And every post we scroll through about the perfect beach body, exercises for a flat stomach, how to get rid of cellulite, find the perfect diet for your body type, is another mound of dirt that pushes us deeper into this suffocating, never-ending hole of self-loathing and disgust. Taking a step off that roller coaster and dismantling societal beauty standards as individuals and as a collective is the single most important step we can take towards self-acceptance and love. This means realizing that beauty cannot be defined by some measurement or number. Realizing that no one person fits this idea of perfect, whatever that is. And most importantly, realizing that we are beautiful and we are worthy of love, respect, and support no matter what. 4% of Australians have an eating disorder. That is over 900,000 people whose lives revolve around what they eat rather than their well being. They are faced with the psychological and emotional turmoil and trauma that accompanies any mental illness. They isolate themselves from the people around them, from fear of judgment, from fear of people noticing how they look, from fear of food. They lose any and all sense of themselves. Their identity slowly slips away from them as they struggle against this little voice in their heads that's constantly yap, yap, yapping at every decision they make. And every day on top of this, they face invalidation. First off, the most commonly recognized eating disorder is anorexia nervosa. Honestly, when any person thinks of an eating disorder, they think of anorexia and someone who is significantly underweight. Bulimia nervosa is also recognized, however, to a lesser degree. And when people think of bulimia, they think of vomiting, and again, someone who is significantly overweight, underweight, sorry, we have no idea the extent to which an eating disorder can affect a person. And worst of all, society has become accustomed to the idea of eating disorder equals anorexia or vomiting equals underweight. We forget that bulimia is actually a, a cycle of restrictive food habits followed by binge eating, followed by purging. We forget about the existence of other eating disorders like binge eating or purging or pica or rumination or anything else that can fit on that list. And worst of all, we stigmatize it. So people who are experiencing this feel invalid because they do not have something that society has classified as an eating disorder. So they 
don't seek help, quietly struggling through it by themselves. Second off, when we think of an eating disorder, we think of underweight. It's, it's a reflex. People who are fat or people who have like some sort of normal body type that we can agree on cannot have an eating disorder, right? Actually, eating disorders have no body type. A person can be fat and struggling with anorexia, bulimia, binge eating, etc. A person can be skinny or extremely fit and muscular or whatever we consider normal and struggling with anorexia, bulimia, binge eating, etc. You cannot look at a person and think, oh hey, they have an eating disorder because they're extremely skinny or oh, hey, they can't have an eating disorder because they look normal or they are fat. It doesn't work like that. A person's experiences with an eating disorder is valid regardless of their weight. What's more is when we think of healthy, we for some reason make this connection to skinny or extremely muscular and fit. I shouldn't have to explain why this is harmful. Um, if skinny is healthy, then by definition, any person who loses weight or already has this body type should be healthy, regardless of what they might be going through, whether that be an illness or a disease or some sort of trauma or a mental illness. Because they are skinny, they are inherently healthy, right? As an extension, our societal fat phobia has bred this idea that anyone who is fat is inherently unhealthy or lazy or a slob or constantly eating. So when a fat person says they have an eating disorder, they face responses like, oh, good, you'll lose some weight, or oh, it doesn't look like it, you look the same. This is disgusting. Mental health illnesses do not discriminate. They are relentless and suffocating in all types of evil but they do not pick and choose their victims. This list of invalidations that a person can experience is honestly inexhaustible. I could go on forever and ever and still not get to the bottom of it. But there is one final statement I would like to make about this. While females do comprise of 64% of people who do struggle with an eating disorder, we cannot generalize based on gender. A male struggle with an eating disorder is just as valid as a female struggle with an eating disorder. Any person's struggle with an eating disorder, regardless of how they identify, is valid and they deserve respect and support. The easiest way to help a person struggling with an eating disorder or any mental health illness is to validate their experiences. Educate yourselves, take the steps to make them feel comfortable Without validation, we breed a culture in which people feel unworthy or unsafe to speak up. They sit and struggle through a world of pain because they feel that they are undeserving of help or that other people need it more. <laughs> this is not true. Your experiences and struggles are valid. Your feelings are valid. Your emotional and physical health and well being are valid. You are valid. Regardless of what you are struggling through or not struggling through, you deserve love, respect and support. Mental health is a never ending spectrum. There are always ways in which it can get worse or better. So don't compare your mental health journey to others and understand that no matter what and above all else, you need to take those steps to look after yourself and love yourself. I want you to think about the people you love most in this world, the people you appreciate and respect or look up to, the people who have had some sort of positive influence in your life. If you were to make a jar with all the memories you have with them or all the reasons you love, respect and appreciate them, what would you put in it? I can almost guarantee you, no, actually, I can definitely guarantee you that nothing you would put in that jar would have anything to do, do with their, their weight, their size, how they look. Your top reasons for loving or respecting them would not be that they have clear skin or a small nose or biceps or a thigh gap. 
Your favorite memories with, with them would not be when they lost X kilograms or when they were on a diet or when they finally got abs. If in our heads, another person's worth is not based on their physical traits, why do we equate our own worth to how we look? You are the person you should love the most above anyone else. It is not selfish, it is not conceited, it is powerful. We have been criticizing and hating and abusing ourselves for so long and we have never gotten anywhere. So let's try something different. Let's validate our experiences with body image and self-acceptance. Realize that they stem from some absurd societal beauty standards that are always changing always constantly changing. And let's learn to love ourselves, by ourselves, for ourselves. Because <laughs> honestly, we deserve nothing less. Thank you, Melly, for your powerful message about self-love and the validation that we are perfect just the way we are. Next up, we have our guest speaker, Charlie Hemmer Hall. WBC champion, anti-bullying ambassador, and corporate boxer. Please welcome Charlie to the stage to talk about anti-bullying. So I am 13 years old, been bullied all my life, and bullying is perhaps the single most destructive experience we've all come in contact with. Most are confronted with bullying during childhood and youth. However, bullying is not limited to a person's early years anymore. Instead, it can confront you in the form of workplace bullying much later in life. No matter where a person comes in contact with bullying, it is always soul crushing. And sadly, people lose their self-esteem and lose their happiness because of it. And bullying can have a truly devastating effect on your life, but it doesn't have to be this way. By speaking out to somebody, anybody, it can make a difference. Maybe it's a friend, family member, a coach, an online helpline, it doesn't matter who. Anyone that will listen, it can and will make a great change in your life. Now, if you do find yourself being a victim of bullying, always speak up to anybody. An organisation like Bullyproof Australia, Kids Helpline and Headspace. These organisations are trained to help you get through any situation that you find yourself in. Also, be sure to Control your destiny and purpose in life. Don't let anybody bring you down from what you want to achieve. Thank you for listening to my message and thank you for this time. Thank you, Charlie, for sharing your personal encounters with bullying and what it is like growing up in today's society. Please welcome to the stage our next presenter, Tino. Tino is going to be talking on the topic of positive mindfulness. Hi, my name is Tino Fidza, and I'm a young adult just like many of you. And just like many of you, I've had experiences in my life with family, friends and relationships that meant my mental health wasn't in tip top shape. Several months ago, I found myself just lost. I was asking questions like, what am I doing with my life? Is it going anywhere? Am I happy? Why aren't I happy? And am I really in control? Asking questions like these is exhausting and it takes a toll on your mental health. And today I want to talk to you guys about what it's like to be through and out the other side of mental health issues. Because while it was a big challenge to overcome these issues, the biggest part was maintaining the new mindset and new attitude that I had. Whether, whatever issue you face, whether it's depression or anxiety or any other type of disorder, we all face the same things. A low mindset, the same repetitive thoughts that try to undermine any attempt of ours to help ourselves or better ourselves. And it's this, these 
detrimental behaviors and habits that trap us in this way and stop us from getting up and out and escaping from whatever is troubling us. So today I'm just going to talk about some key things to re-establishing some behaviors that keep us motivated, keep us positive, and that are just important to having a good mental well-being. The thing that I noticed when going through these issues is that I stopped doing the things that I enjoy subconsciously. I stopped talking to my friends as much. I stopped playing the games I like and going outside. And you'd think that you'd notice that all these important things are missing from your life, but it just goes to show how impactful these issues can be and how much of their life they can, of our life they can overcome. And I know while many of us think that just watching Netflix is good enough to get by, we are really complex people. Our brains are just so advanced and it requires a lot of stimulation. So we always need to find something new or something to try that will challenge us as we go through life. Dealing with mental health sometimes can taint the things we usually like. It might be associated with a sport, we might have a bad experience, and so it makes it hard for us to enjoy the things we usually do. So again, it's important to find something new and to try something. I'm someone who's always liked skateboarding and longboarding, but mainly just cruising. I never really ventured into doing tricks or going to the skate park, and quite frankly, I didn't think I'd be any good. But a few months ago, I decided to get myself a skateboard and just commit to going to the skate park maybe once a week and trying something out. A few, well now, I've, had, I've met a lot of people through it, I've had a lot of great experiences, and it's now my stress reliever. Whenever I've had a long week, I decide to go out, ride my skateboard and try some new things. And it's something as small as that, just trying a new hobby that's helped me establish these new things in my life that keep me motivated. I have a new network of friends. I have something to do and something to keep me distracted. While I'd love for everyone to become a skateboarder, we're all different and we all enjoy different things. So finding what you can do can take a bit of time. But in the meantime, there's some behaviors you can adopt to help keep yourself motivated. And I guess I commit these to two important things. Taking things one day at a time. And secondly, committing every day when you wake up to try and do something positive for yourself. And remember that this is a ongoing battle. You do it every day. It can't just be one week of, all right, I'll take care of myself, I'll have some fun, I'll do these things. It's an everyday commitment. And I guess what, why this is important is because you've got to take things one a day at a time. If you try and look ahead to your whole life and all the battles that you might face, it's a lot. It, might, it seems like a lot. And even now, in, when we face through school, through work, we have to organize a calendar of a lot of events. But when we just break it down into small things, it's easier for us to co focus on and to cope with. And that's why it's important to break it down. And secondly, when I say keep the ball rolling in mental health, it is about doing that. It's about every day making sure that it's going. It's not just one push and it's good. You really need to, every day, say, right, I'm gonna try to do something positive or do something new to keep the ball rolling. Thank you. Thank you, Tino, for sharing your message of positive mindfulness and what you do to maintain positive mental health. Next up, we have Sky Lee, who will be talking about her personal experience with stress and resilience. Hello everyone and welcome to this year's Avenue to Awareness talk. My name is Sky Lee and today I'll be talking about stress and resilience and how I cope with them. Before we begin, I'd like to give you a bit of a backstory about me. I am 23 years old. I live at home with my mum and nan while I study at Central Queensland University. When I was three years old, my parents divorced and had joint custody of me. When I was 15, my mother received a job up here in Gladstone. And when I was 18, I got into the Australian Air Force. At the same time, I got accepted into university. I still don't know why I didn't join the Air Force, but that's a story for another time. So what is stress? Well, according to the Mental Health Foundation, stress can be defined as the degree to which we feel overwhelmed or unable to cope as a result of pressures that are unmanageable. 
Stress is our body's response to pressures from a situation or life event and can, what affects stress can vary from person to person. The first time I considered myself to experience stress was when I was 13, I mean 16, in grade 11. I had a huge art assessment and I was doing the final touches for it because it was due the next day. I had all the photographs in my frame and everything was perfect. Then I stood up. In the process of standing up, I stood on my frame, which caused the glass to break. It took me a second to realize what had happened. And when I did, I just began crying. My mum and Nan came in. They saw what happened. Mum sat with me and hugged me saying, it's okay. And Nan helped me clean up my now broken art assessment. This was in 2013, when seniors still had to do OP assessments to get into university. And as I cried, I said, Mum, I don't want to go to school anymore. I don't want to do OP anymore. And I didn't. It was way too stressful. Even now, I think that grade 11 and 12 is too stressful for students. On top of that, I had the guidance counsellor telling me that I was going to be getting an OP 19 or below, which is like the bottom of OP ranks. And it made me feel like I was stupid. But I wasn't. I never was. I just didn't study for exams. My mum, however, was amazing. She sat there and listened to me cry and said, Sky, if you don't want to do OP subjects anymore, that's fine. We'll go into school tomorrow and sort it out. Not once did she force me to do OP subjects or to get A's or get angry because I only got C's. She was and has always been there, standing behind me, ready to catch me if I fall and to help me back up again if I do. Even now at university, I stress so much knowing that I have assessments due. And I find that it's helpful to have her there to talk to about it. If there's one thing I have learned about stress, it's that it's always best to have someone to talk to, whether it be family, a friend, or a total stranger. If you can't find somebody near you that you can talk to, there are so many different organisations out there that have people who are willing to listen and willing to support you through your time of stress. Organisations like Beyond Blue, uh, Lifeline Australia, Men's Line Australia, Kids Helpline, Headspace, Black Dog Institute. They're all institutes that will help you deal with not only stress, but other mental health issues that you may face. The next topic I'd like to talk about is resilience. Resilience is the ability to adapt to change. For example, you might experience trauma and the grief and pain that comes with that trauma. However, you are still able to function both physically and psychologically. Think of resilience like your body's ability to adapt to change, a body's ability to adapt to climate, sorry. You might originate from, say, the North Pole where it's snowing and cold and you have to wear a big jacket and some boots all the time. And then you decide to move to the Caribbean where it's hot and sunny all year long. At first you find that it's really hot and you're always sweaty and sticky and thirsty but your body gradually begins to change. It begins to climatize, acclimatize to the weather and you don't feel so sweaty or sticky or hot anymore. You have acclimatized to the Caribbean weather. Acclimatization is my metaphor for resilience. Your body does the same thing. It feels everything strongly at first, but then your body begins adapting to the changes around you. You become resilient in the face of adversity. I believe I am a resilient person. My parents divorced when I was three. I don't remember it much. When I was 13, I ran away from home. It happened, I've accepted it. When I was 15, my mum got a job and we moved from everything that I knew in Brisbane. Now I could have acted out, but I didn't. 
Admittedly, the first week of school, I was extremely sad. I was sad to the point where I couldn't lift my hand up to brush my hair. I had to get mum to brush my hair in the mornings because I didn't have it in, I didn't have the strength to do it myself. I had no friends until one day, at the end of the week, I made a friend. Now, I have never not had a friend. So for me, this was a completely new experience. But the moment I said hello and they said, hey, do you want to have lunch with me? I was ecstatic. My dark cloud had vanished. It couldn't be seen and everything was right again in the world. Being able to take that first step and say hello when I felt so sad inside, to me, that was being resilient. Now, it took me quite a while to figure out what I was going to talk about today. And after thinking and thinking, I honestly couldn't think of any, uh, any mental health issues that I could personally talk about. That's not to say I am somehow immune to mental health issues, because I'm not. There were times in my life that I have suffered trauma, but I have been resilient enough and I had the world's greatest buffer, my mum and nan, that were there to support me. Thanks to them, I can look at the me now to the me when I was 12 years old and I can say, I don't think my personality has changed much. With everything that has happened in my life, it amazes me that I am still me, that I have been resilient enough to still be me. And that's what I hope that you can do as well. I hope that you can see the you now and say, I am still the me that I was when I was 12 years old. Because everybody, absolutely everybody deserves to be resilient. And being resilient helps us to live through all the changes that happen throughout our lives. And if you are struggling, that's okay. But remember, you do not have to do it alone. I certainly didn't. I had my mum and nan there to support me. Whether it's your family, a friend, or a professional, find that one person that is willing to listen to you and to provide support because no one has to go it alone. If you take one thing away from this talk today, I hope you know that stress is okay. Stress is normal. And everybody feels stress at one point or another throughout their lives. Remember, there are ways that you can manage your stress. You just need to figure out the best strategy that works for you. Thank you for listening to me today. Have a wonderful day and keep on smiling. Thank you, Sky, for shedding light on the topic of stress and resilience and knowing that if you're going through tough times, you're not in this alone. Next on stage, we have Gabby, who will be talking about her personal experience with mental health. Someone once said, do not judge my story based on the chapter you walked in on. The story I'm going to be sharing today is a story of not only sadness, grief and pain, but a story of courage, bravery and love. This is my story. I'm here today to talk about one of the longest relationships I've had in my life and that being the relationship with my mental health. And like many relationships, it has definitely come with its ups and downs. I had an incredible childhood with loving parents, amazing friends, and a beautiful, beautiful perception of the world. I was very fortunate in that sense. However, this all started to go downhill as soon as the ever so dreaded social shift came in the transition of going to high school. This is where my mental health issues began to arise. Like many, I suffered and dealt with bullying, which created great insecurity in not only myself as a person, but an insecurity of people in general. Because if they were my friends and they treated me like this, then what would people that didn't like me say? However, being the strong-willed and outspoken person I am, I changed that and left. And after grade seven, my life was back on track. I was ready to conquer the world with my new friends and my new outlook and perspective on life. This is one of many parts in the story where tragedy strikes. I received a phone call on the 4th of November, 2016, a day I will never forget. The phone call was from my best friend. She was crying. 
I asked what's wrong. She'd then give me the news that I'd never imagined coming out of her mouth. She told me that a friend of ours that we'd gone to school with had attempted suicide. I immediately hung up the phone and went into a state of rage, just constantly asking my que myself questions over and over again. He then passed away two days later. This was my first large experience with grief and a shocking one at that. I blamed myself, I blamed others, I blamed everyone. I was 13 at the time. This was the first time my heart had ever been broken because I was so un unsure of what was worse, the shock of what happened or the pain of what never will. It's fair to say that this truly broke me, but I chose not to deal with it and move on, to just push it into the back of my mind and hope that one day I would be okay. And for a while, that worked. Until I started to develop a fear of being happy. I was so scared that if I became happy again, something horrific would happen and I would have the exact same feeling of heartbreak and grief all over again. My once happy and optimistic perception of the world had drastically changed. It was now a dark place in which I had to adjust to the tragedies in my life that forced me to grow up before I had the chance to make that decision myself. This caused me to have panic attacks almost every single day in which someone could make the smallest comment about my eyebrows being too dark or my hair looking a little messy. That was all it took for me to spiral out of control and end up fainting on the floor of my classroom in front of everyone. I refused to get out of bed, and this is when my family finally knew something wasn't right. So I finally did one of the toughest things I'd ever had to do in my life. I got help. I did it. I got help in December of 2017. After over a year of fighting the battle that belonged in my head, I got help. And I won that battle with the help of people at Headspace and my loving family and friends and the willingness and need not to feel the way I did. My anxiety and grief is something that I will always carry with me, but it's something I now embrace and fight through every day. But I now have the courage to do that because I truly believe that if I didn't get help, this story would not have the same ending. Thank you, and I hope that your story, like mine, has the happy ending it deserves. Thank you, Gabby, for sharing your story and highlighting the importance of speaking up and seeking help. I would like to introduce our next and final speaker, for today, Abby. Abby is the Deputy Chair of our Youth Council Committee and this is the second time that she will be sharing her personal journey with mental illness. Depression and suicide are difficult subjects to talk about. It can be difficult to know what to say and for that reason I think a lot of people choose to say nothing at all. All this does is further isolate the person struggling. It's important to tell our stories in safe places, so today I'll be doing my best to tell mine. I wouldn't say my childhood was average, but I wouldn't say it was bad either. Aside from a few traumatic events as a child, including a violent divorce, near fatal car crash, and the passing of my grandfather, by 12 years old, everything seemed on track. And for the most part, everything was on track until my friend's birthday in October, 2013. We just watched Insidious 2 at the cinemas and we were waiting to get the bus home when a group of adults held us up, robbed us and made violent threats. Thankfully, police became involved before the situation escalated. However, this event took a bigger toll on my mental well-being than I could ever acknowledge. I was adamant I didn't need counselling at the time. I tried my best to forget what had happened and refused to talk to anyone about it. After this, I started to notice my anxiety, more so how heightened it had become. I was always quite anxious as a child, but I had started struggling with things that I never used to struggle with. I stopped going out in public unless I had someone bigger than me around to protect me. I constantly looked over my shoulder. I wouldn't even go to the toilet in public places without someone waiting for me in close proximity. I also saw how much the anxiety began to affect my last couple months of year seven, I was noticeably more socially awkward and I no longer felt safe and protected around the friendship group that I had established. In 2014, at 13 years old, a few months after being held up, I decided it was time to seek help for how it was affecting my life and how it was affecting me. Honestly, I didn't see the change I was hoping for from counselling. My issues stemmed from a mistrust in adults and I wasn't willing to be vulnerable around my therapist who was just an, another adult I didn't know. And when I was vulnerable, I felt dismissed. 
I began to self-harm and shortly after stopped attending therapy. My anxiety was making it difficult to go to school, but my constant absence put a huge target on my back for bullies. It was easy to pick on the girl that wasn't around half of the time to defend herself. When I did go to school, I never knew what I was walking into, but I always knew it was gonna be pretty bad. By midway through year eight, I had missed more school than I had attended. Eventually the bullying, which had now become physical, constant unprovoked panic attacks and anxiety had got too much to handle. I'd only heard horror stories of high school dropouts and the opportunities they throw away with them. But anything seemed better than what I was facing at school, so dropping out of year eight was a chance that I took. My experiences in life were making me feel too old for my physical age. I started gravitating towards older people I felt I could relate to. The time I was unaware, but I was trauma bonding, befriending people who had been through similar traumatic events, which put myself in incre increasingly dangerous and impulsive situations. Hanging out with people who expected no healthy behavior from me, no change, no boundaries. I didn't realize how enabling this is for me and for my friends. I spent the remainder of the year sleeping or doing dumb impulsive things that gave me a rush of adrenaline. Living with anxiety and depression was becoming exhausting. I felt stuck in this never ending cycle a never ending battle with myself. I spent so much time sleeping, but I still woke up exhausted, an indescribable type of exhausted that followed me throughout the day. I started to forget who I was aside from the depression. I lost my hobbies. I lost interest in everything that made me different and unique. I didn't know who I was without the sadness and suffering anymore. I thought about suicide a lot throughout the year, but it was a thought that I kept to myself. By the end of 2014, everything was plummeting downhill at a rate faster than I could keep up. I was not speaking to or seeing my dad at all, and my relationship with my mum was falling apart rapidly. I had no plans for schooling. My self-harm was increasing and becoming more serious. My depression was worsening. I'd been through about four different therapists and three different medications and had received a clinical diagnosis for my anxiety and depression. I started to lose hope that this was something that would improve or pass. At the start of 2015, at 14 years old, I made my first disclosure about thinking of ending my life. This led me to my first admission in the psychiatric ward. I was placed on a different medication and received another mental health diagnosis. I started year nine at an alternate schooling program. I enjoyed every minute of year nine. I made good friends. I had supportive teachers. I learnt so much. I didn't have the added anxiety from bullying like I did at my old school. Things should have been improving for me, but those persistent suicidal feelings stayed. My mood was becoming increasingly unstable. I was ex experiencing extremely high highs and unbearingly low lows. I was becoming erratic. Every little setback was getting harder and harder to bounce back from. I had another stay in the psychiatric ward, and then another, and then another. Over the course of 2015, I had totaled five admissions. My mum really didn't know how to support me, so she made the decision to place me in government care for 90 days, and I was placed in a residential care facility. I'd convinced myself I was unwanted, unloved, and unlovable. And whilst I understand my mum's reasoning for making that decision now, at the time it just confirmed those thoughts. I returned home, and shortly after, things looked like they were improving again. My relationship with my mum was healing. We had so many more resources available to us from my time in Resi. But depression and anxiety don't just go away. And I'd checked out a while before that. Out of everything I had been through and everything I'd already overcome, the mental exhaustion was one of the hardest. No matter how persistent I could be in continuing, I felt I was fighting a losing battle. I had everything to fight for but nothing to give. So I attempted to take my life and came close to succeeding. The month that followed was spent in hospital, two weeks in intensive care and two weeks at my final psych ward admission. Three days after leaving hospital, my stepdad moved me up to Gladstone permanently. By 2016, at 15 years old, I had lived in Gladstone for a little over a month and I began finding things that helped me to help myself. My road to recovery was strenuous and most importantly, everlasting. I started going to the gym and I know, I used to roll my eyes whenever people told me to exercise because it's the last thing you feel like doing when you're depressed. 
but the effect it had on my well-being was incredible. I felt strong physically and mentally. During the day, I'd attend online schooling through distance education, which gave me the support I needed to finish year 10 whilst focusing purely on my schoolwork and not having to worry about social interactions. Of an afternoon, I'd attend DBT with my mum. This was a year of intensive group therapy. However, it was working and I could tell it was working. My mum and I had a new way of communicating and I had so many new tools and ways to manage my emotions and implement healthy coping mechanisms. Perhaps one of the most valuable things I discovered was Buddhism and meditation. I threw myself pretty heavily into Buddhist teachings, using what I learned not to be a better Buddhist, but a better person in general. Buddhist philosophy is forgiving. Nothing is fixed or permanent and change is always possible. This can be extremely comforting like it is for me, depending on perception. Life will always be imperfect, but it will always be what I make of it and I can change direction anytime. I spent so many years trying to avoid my feelings, to avoid the suffering in my everyday life, and Buddhism taught me quite simply to sit with those feelings, to confront them and know that like anything, they too will pass. The avoidance of suffering is a form of suffering and the avoidance of struggle is a struggle. A month after turning 16, I started renting and living independently. I had to do things for myself and I was able to celebrate the achievements of being able to do them all the adulty things without really being an adult. I appreciated more. I understood the importance of looking after myself, for myself. Don't get me wrong, I still have my ups and downs. Those days where relapse seems imminent and it seems all too easy to fall back into cycles of depression. Life will probably always be a roller coaster ride for me, but I'm getting better at recognizing the signs, recognizing my reactions, and showing myself the kindness and forgiveness that I hold myself to show others. Some days I feel stagnant, other days I look back and realize that I've moved mountains. There's been many triumphs to celebrate since my attempt. There's also been many more negative experiences, but a common is that I bounce back. Each time I bounce back quicker, I bounce back stronger. Whilst I've sat in my sadness, I no longer unpack my bags. Without negative experiences, we could never truly appreciate the good ones. Like Buddhism taught me a new way to love myself, my mental health journey taught me a new way to view the world, a new way to appreciate opportunities I otherwise would have missed. This year I turned 20 and I'm grateful to be here today. I'm grateful to be telling my story because a few years ago I never could have imagined anything remotely positive coming out of it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Abby. Your courage and conviction in sharing your personal story is inspiring. An important note to highlight is that life will always be imperfect, but it will always be what you make it, and you can change direction at any time. That concludes today's speakers. Thank you for tuning into our Avenue to Awareness event today and listening to the young people of our community share their experiences with mental illness. I would also like to say thank you to Headspace for their support, Councillor Churchill, guest speaker Charlie Hall, and our extremely courageous Gladstone Region Youth Council Committee members for presenting today. It is hoped that their bravery and willingness to share their stories can make a difference in the lives of others. Speak up, seek help, and take time for your mental health.